With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom. Simply visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate to make a difference today. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week we'll find out what they think about the debacle unfolding inside Kainga Ora. They're New Zealand's worst landlord and it looks like they're New Zealand's worst financial managers as well. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. Good to have you back. G'day, Cameron. You good this week? Always good, mate. I'm not. I'm always good. Good. Because no one cares. And what subject do you want this week, mate? Um, look, there's been a bit of a fuss in the media about uh, the parlous financial state of Kainga Ora. And it's billions of dollars in debt, uh, not financially um, stable going forward. And uh, I want to know what you think about that. Well, it's just another big monumental labour failure, right? Chuck money at things. Think money equals will solve your problems and realise it just doesn't. You can't yeah, just I chuck I billions. Th- of- yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think it's a problem per se with Kaying Aura or the staff or at a certain level of the staff, but I think certainly at the governance level, at the board, and certainly the ministers that were in charge. I mean, would you have a guess at who the ministers were who were in charge of that? Megan Woods. She was and one of them. Clifford. Exactly. You got it 100%. You're up with the play on politics. <laughs> so, so those two those two numpties <clears throat> were the architects of this demise and, and you know, helpfully handled uh, – or enabled by Grant Robertson with no fiscal controls over what was going on. And uh, it seems to me that there's a a systemic problem amongst Labour politicians that they have no idea how to govern things. No, well, Phil Twyford was such a failure that even Jacinda, who was always scared to demote people, was he was one of the only ones that she demoted. He was such a failure. It was this Kiwi build. It was a, like a disaster. An embarrassment. And yeah. yet here he is in charge of Kainga Aura for a bit. Crazy. And totally look crazy. at the result. Billions of dollars wasted. There's just more failings. I mean, you've got to feel sorry for Luxon. He's, he's trying to mop up so many problems at the same time. Massive. Where do you start when everything's failing at the same time? Yeah, well, then. I mean, and it's billions of dollars here. And, you know, these clowns are sitting there lecturing us all about how they were fiscally um, safe and sound uh, in dealing with dealing with the stuff. And, and they, just, they just weren't. No, I know. And, I mean, you, you have to be fiscally prudent with your household expenses, business expenses, and governments need to be as well because the money just won't last forever. And... I mean, how, do these people treat their own bank accounts like this? Just ginormous, uh, uh, you know, lending and uh, it's just, I, I, I don't understand it personally. I, I really honestly don't. Is there any Labour MPs that have successfully run quite a big business? No, and, you know, I see on Tuesday uh, Barbara Edmonds, the Labour finance spokesperson, who's um, basically uh, been a tax lawyer and then worked in Treasury, is coming out and saying yeah. that, that uh, the budget that Nicola Willis is going to deliver, and you have to argue that Barbara Edmonds is possibly a slightly more qualified than the BA carrying uh, Nicola Willis, but but has come out saying that this budget is going to be full of smoke and mirrors. And I thought to myself, you know, that's more cheek than a fat lady's bum to, <laughs> to say that when you've had you – know, there's three words that I could say to them about that. Um, when they're talking about smoke and mirrors, and that's well-being budget, which was all oh, smoke and mir- mirrors, you know. It was complete and utter failure. And don't measure the results. That no, was, that they was don't. the well-being budget. That's right. Throw well, billions at stuff and don't measure. Well, you know, they, they spent $1.9 billion on mental health and not one single outcome has improved. Uh, this is just sy- no, it's symptomatic. Yeah, it's symptomatic of how Labour views things. What they do is they think 
that the metric for success is how much money you've spent. No, it's astounding how much money they wasted. And we could have had some nice stuff. We could have had some new highways and bridges and new hospitals. Instead, well, that's we the thing. You know, they, could have built, nothing uh, they could have built a surgical hospital or uh, in Auckland. You know, that just all the surgery in Auckland goes to that hospital. Uh, and then free up that would free up space in all the other hospitals that are all around the place, other than just sort of, sort of emergency surgery and things like that. There's a number of things they could. Have, I mean, they could have built the bloody hospital in Dunedin, which is still not even out of the ground. But the problem we have is that until we get a decent media that questions both governments or any government, like they're attacking Luxon now, if they'd attack Jacinda the same, you know, or the previous Labor government, because yeah, it's just so hard to make a with the average punter's interest in politics any sort of you know sound bites in the news. It's it's impossible to push the other you know the fiscal responsibility. You know you just literally can't borrow for either. Even the United States is you know going to run out of money. Oh, they'll just print some more. A little country like New Zealand just can't do that. No, we have to live uh, within our means. You know, if you keep going into overdraft. Constantly, the bank eventually says no. Yeah. And governments can get big overdraft on the back of taxpayers, but it still can only get to a certain level before you're, you know, collapsing under your own weight. And New Zealand's at that point. And Mr. Luxon has got to be part of the team that's got to do the ugly part and start cutting and, and gets attacked for it. But I, I don't know what they propose as the other solution, just continue on into, you know, complete financial ruin. So, yeah, it's, look, this is just another thing, another failure, and there'll be more and more, and it's, it's going to take a long time to recover. So, yeah, that's my take on that. All right. Anyway. Anything else that's um, ripping your undies at the moment? Um, actually, I've had a really busy week, so I haven't actually been watching the news. But uh, no, no, n- nothing massive that I've could not, um, noticed. No. <laughs> I've actually been productive at work, Kim. Hmm. Well, you you need to be productive uh, to pay lots of tax so that all the people <laughs> who are bludging can continue to bludge. And, uh, and, yes, and, and, that old thing. and the nation thanks you. <laughs> okay, thanks, mate. Okay, thanks for calling. Catch you next week. Welcome to Cam's Buddies and Lee. Good to have you back. Hi, Cam. Are you feeling fantastic today? I always feel fantastic, Lindley. You know oh, why I always good. feel. I'm pleased to hear it. You know why I always feel fantastic? Because you convince yourself to. Well, yes, there's that, but nobody cares if you're not. They just ask you out of you know out of courtesy, but they don't actually care if you say, "Oh no, actually, yeah, my shoulder's killing me. I've got a sore neck. I've got a crooked knee." They've stopped caring about five seconds before you know after after you open your mouth. So I just just say, "Yeah, everything's fantastic," and it always is. Well, you see, I've got this lad in uh, Mitre 10, and for the third time today, um, or third time I've struck him, and I struck him today, and I say to him, oh, hi, how are you? And he says, I'm not too bad, (laughs) which is a fairly um, traditional thing for Kiwis to say. And I say to him every time, well, now that I know what you aren't, what actually are you? (laughs) <laughs> He'll probably and, be and flummoxed. He, he, he's absolutely flummoxed, and um, and he's still flummoxed. He hasn't worked it out yet. Oh, well. But, but that's typical. That's typical of what people say. But anyway, yeah. I so I'm fantastic. And I'm, topic. I'm fa- fantastic, and I'm picking your fantastic. I am. So. But I really, I really am. No, good. I really am too, because <laughs> because if you if you have a mindset that you're fantastic, then you'll be fantastic. I think so. Yeah, power of positive thinking. I think I think somebody wrote a book about that. Oh yes, they did. Made a fortune. Yeah, and he was fantastic after that. Mm. So anyway, Kaying Aura, we've seen the revelations have come out this week that they're woke and broke that the board has not really been governing the organisation and the two ministers that were in charge of it, Phil Twyford and Megan Woods, have just let this, 
you know, it used to be called the Ministry of Housing. It's called Kainga Ora now. Apparently uh, giving something a Maori name makes it better. Uh, apart from being New Zealand's worst landlord, uh, have managed to beggar the nation uh, while they've been building not much. Well, I think it's an absolute travesty. And it's in common with what's happening right through every government department, right through all the local councils, down to the smallest committees. They're all broke. They all run amuck with the money. And it's an absolute disgrace. And we've just had um, put, put our submissions in for the long-term plan for our councils. It's absolutely yep. broke too. But anyway, it, it, um, no I just want to say to these... No accountability at all. But I just want to say, I own my own home and I got it the hard way. Yep. And I have to run a budget to keep it. It's yep. not beneath my dignity to grow my own veggies, to scrounge the forest floors with cones and kindling, to oh, run they, the they, roads. They make the best fires, though. Those cones, well, man, they make the best is, fires. It's crackling away at the moment. It does the hot water. It does the heating. I can cook on it. You see, I'm thrifty. Mm. And I don't mind running the roads instead of a gym subscription. And I do most of my house maintenance myself, Cam, and that's called budgeting. Yeah. Now, this Kai, now I, why is it called Kyanga? It's K A I N G A. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it means. Well, anyway, Kyanga Aura is above such things, isn't it? It's become addicted to handouts. That's really the problem. You know, and it, it saddens think... me because this is an organisation that is supposed to look after the most needy in New Zealand, right? They, they are New Zealand's biggest landlord, and the people that they have uh, residing in their homes are the people that theoretically in most need. And yet they have blown billions and billions of dollars on debt, on uh, fanciful plans, uh, and gold-plated um, homes that are probably going to just get trashed. Uh, and all the while kept on going back to Grant Robertson, the finance minister, and asking for more money. And they've got it, you see. That's the problem. I mean, who am I going to ask for a handout, you know? I'm well, not nobody. going to get a handout. So, so, so you know, that's out of my mind because that avenue's not, not there. But they've got that avenue. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're just animals. And they've learned that's where they go for their pot of gold. So they keep going back there. They never learn to think in a different way, be visionary or something, cut the cloth to fit the garment and all that sort of stuff. Do you think they that there's... Do it. Yeah, do you think there's a systemic problem with particularly Labour politicians that they have a lack of understanding about how how money is earned and therefore uh, how they spend it? And as a result, they also have uh, no ability uh, or experience in actually running anything or building anything, and that's why you see organisations like Kaing Aura, that they fill the board positions with their flunkies. You know, the chairperson was former Labour Minister Mark Goshi, uh, a union man. Uh, he was the chair of the board. He's, he's, he resigned earlier in the year. Um, the entire board was filled with wombles, woke wombles, uh, who really didn't know anything about the organisation that they were governing. Is this a systemic problem that we're going to see revealed periodically over the next few months of one organisation after another that has had poor uh, governance from not only the board but also the ministers that were responsible for it? Well, it couldn't be more systemic, and that's absolutely my point. And, you know, this is the crux of all government entities down to local councils and, as I said, the smallest of bureaucrat committees. They all believe in buy now, pay later, yeah, and then when it catches up on them, they borrow more and more, and then more. And I've got a suggestion for them, which sounds to me like you'll agree with. <clears throat> I I suggest that they phone their own government service 
which is the New Zealand government money talks. I'll even give them the phone number, 0800 345 123, <laughs> or the Citizens, Citizens Advice Bureau, and yeah. they sign up for their own free and confidential budget advice and learn how to run a budget because <clears throat> paying compounding interest doesn't work. It gets you in the SHIT. Now, I think you'll agree with that. I do. I do agree with it. I think yeah. that at the very least, the people who are on the board of Kaiangora should be given remedial budgeting lessons. Uh, at the very least, because if they were running a private company and were doing what they were doing, they'd be prosecuted because what they've done well, is actually criminal. It is. It's absolutely outlandish. I mean, have you sort of looked into some of the local council debts? Oh, I know. It's eye-watering. Absolutely. It's absolutely eye-watering. And they don't care. And you see, they're the same. They have got a um, <clears throat> a tap that they can turn on for funding, and it's called a captive clientele. That's ratepayers. Well, yep. this Kainga Aura, it's got um, a tap to turn on, and it's called government funding. But they don't have to do anything. They don't have to. I mean, what happens? Who actually sits there and... Does anybody add up expenses, um, income and expenses and all those simple things? Well, you would have thought the ministers would do that or, or at the very least Grant Robertson. But who pays the penalty apart from the taxpayer? We pay the penalty of their poor governance. Yeah. But who actually pays a penalty for stuffing something up so royally? I mean, there, there surely must be consequences for... Well, poor, I don't think there actions. are, and I'll, I'll tell you what, Cam, I, I do actually think it's all governments. Um, I'm happy to just blame Labour and the Greens and that, but I, I think... No, that they're all the same. As you I agree said, with you. Systemic, yeah, systemic is the word you said. I um, wrote down a sentence here because I had to do this for a fortnight ago for another reason for somebody else, and I want to read this out to you. This is typical. This is Sir Bill English's... Um, he, he led a review, you know, of this dire situation. Yep. And this is typical of one of the outcomes of that review. It's a 45-word sentence. We found that Kainga Aura is not financially viable under current settings, and this is further compounded by limited attention to value for money and opaque apportionment of costs and revenue within Kainga Aura, making it difficult to identify the underlying drivers of financial results. That's 45 words. And my six-word sentence is they're broken, they don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. No, I think, Bill, I think Bill English knows why they're broke. But, uh, yes, the organisation is broke and they don't know why, and they think that they can just carry on. They do. And <clears throat> they've got an operating deficit of, operating deficit of $520 million. Um, heading maybe for seven hundred million if something's not done. I hear that they've got thirty and a half thousand on the waiting list for housing. Yeah, they're, they're and, morons. And it needs, and it needs twenty one billion dollars with a B over the next four years just to cover the losses. And then. Kieran McNulty, he said that all this could have been avoided if the government had committed to ongoing funding. Well, I'll tell you what, I could have avoided a lot of hardship in my housing quest if I received ongoing funding. Oh, that's right, but isn't I it? But I never received... That, that just shows how out of touch they are, that Kieran McNulty, the, the putative leader of the opposition, the guy who's waiting to for Chris Hipkins to fail so he can step into his boots, uh, is saying that. It shows how out of touch they are. But then again, he's, he also said he was proud to be a socialist. And we all know that socialists oh. have a very poor grasp on economics. Uh, it's never worked anywhere in the world. And every time you point this out to them, they say, oh, well, that's because that country did it wrong. And if we just do it our way, oh, that, then it'll work better. Is that what they say? 
Oh, yeah. yeah. But when you say to them, you know, if socialism was so grand, how come Venezuela, that's got more oil than any other country in the world, how come Venezuela's broke? And they go, oh, well, that's because they did socialism wrong. That's what they say to you. Yes, but when they do socialism, um, they don't, they're not down amongst the mob, you know. They, they're still up on the hill living a grand right. life. But that's the thing with socialists, that, that, right, is they never, ever have to take the lumps of coal like, the, like, the, like everybody else. They're always with their snouts in the trough, um, and that's why it doesn't work. That's right. No, it's a fantasy. Yeah, more, but, um, more misery has been visited on the people of Earth by communism and socialism than any other governmental system ever. I could, couldn't agree more, and I don't know if you've read Orwell's 1984, but uh, I could only get halfway through it because it was so horrifying. You know, I had to, actually had to give it up halfway, and then <laughs> I, I went online and read a review of it so, so I could know how it ended, but... Well, Jacinda Ardern um, used that actually, as a playbook rather than a, a war. You know, Orwell wrote 1984 and 1948, and he wrote it as a warning. But Jacinda Ardern obviously picked a copy up from the library and thought, oh, this is all awesome. I'll do this. This is exactly what we oh, need I to know. do. Yeah, and, and did it uh, and, and learned how to turn, turn the people against themselves. <clears throat> then they don't have to go out. They don't need a police force or anything um, because uh, they've taught people to dob their neighbours in and all that sort of thing. Absolutely horrifying. Um, I hope they never get in again. It was the most terrible experience. Just imagine um, what she was like at school. She would have been the class snitch. Oh, well, I don't know what she'd have been like. I can't imagine... I'll tell you what, when you had that chap on, um, did an interview with him absolutely ages ago, and he said she was such a lovely person, I just about choked. <laughs> that was Simon Lusk. <laughs> that I was... can't remember who it was, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> it's, it was Simon Lusk. He's the only person I know who says that Jacinda is lovely. Yes. Well, he, he sort of wasn't on the far end of her like a lot of us were. But no. um, but also they they've got other problems with this housing as well, um, and and how it's got into such a dire state. They've got uh, massive increased immigration really for a wee country, and oh, again yeah. it's the buy now pay later thing theory because they get they get the people in first and then worry about the infrastructure afterwards. You know, they do put the cart before the horse, don't they? I'm. Pretty certain then, if that if that we if Labor had got back in, Grant Robertson would have commissioned some genetic modification of some particular plants so that we could have a native money tree growing in short order. But he would spend a hundred billion dollars trying to make that happen. Yes, well, and he'd borrow it. Mm. But then the other, the other thing is that occurred to me when I was thinking about it, um, and that that's the solo parent situation and. Like, I know that, that um, there are some solo parents that really have to get rid of their spouse one way or the other because, you know, they're violent or whatever. Um, but there's so many solo parents now, and that creates two houses out of one very often because you've got mum and the kids in one house, and then where does the, uh, the bloke go, you know? He, he needs a house as well, doesn't he? So well, yeah, or it usually pick, picks up some other uh, poor, unsuspecting woman and moves in with her and, and continues on his drinking, gambling, bashing ways, and then there's another house involved. That's right. It was so much more stable um, years ago when they had the state houses and that because, you know, they, they went basically to hard-working, low-income families, so you had Ma, Pa and the kids all in the one house. Yeah. Um, so they only needed one house for the family, but when the family splits up, then then you need more than one house very often. Yep. So that that is an issue too. And then um, the other thing is, once they've built all these promised houses uh, and they put people in them, they've then got to pay or often have to pay rental subsidies for the tenants. So that that's an added cost, and it's absolutely huge. Well, I don't know if you and I are going to ever solve the problems of 
this nation where people expect the government to solve absolutely every problem that they come to mind. You know, we, we see it all the time. Labor's out there saying, well, what we need is the government to feed the kids at school. Uh, and so then they come mm. up with this program. It's not funded properly. Uh, we're spending millions upon millions of dollars feeding kids at school. And and whilst I sort of agree with the sentiment that, well, if we don't feed them, then they'll get nothing, I, I just struggle to believe that the vast majority of parents in this country uh, don't care enough about their kids to send them to school with lunch. And, uh, you know, they can well, do with budgeting advice and, you know, stop smoking cigarettes and stop buying fatty foods and stop um, spending money mm -hmm. on, on lotto or the or the dogs or the or the races or the booze or whatever they could they're making poor choices but but it seems that the safety net that we have in New Zealand that, that was originally envisaged as a safety net has actually become a trampoline and in some cases a hammock for people yeah, well, it will always do that. I mean, the intentions were good at the beginning, but, you know, even, like, it's beneath people's dignity to send their kids off to school now with, let's say, cheese and marmite sandwiches, you know, that that's just... Uh, and all the experts are out there saying, oh, they can't do that, it's absolutely dreadful, you know. Well, my um, mother but, used to my right. mother used to put butter on the bread and then sprinkle marm, um, Milo on it and send me to school with Milo sandwiches. And you're still here today. Well, they were delicious. You know, once the that butter soaks all the way through that Milo, the crunchiness is all gone, and it's all this buttery chocolate <laughs> goodness on white bread. On white bread. <laughs> oh well, that's absolutely dreadful, isn't it? You know, but I mean, even the um, nutrition experts are out there saying this is absolutely dreadful. But you know, when I went to school, we just had lunch. We didn't have a uh, three course meal. Well, I, I challenge um, those public health people that are whining about this who go on about saying we need to have nutritious meals. They, they Have you ever seen these people? They don't look happy at all. No. They look miserable, right? They look like lemon-sucking, miserable, I won't say the next word. And, you know, I challenge them, if they think these meals that uh, the schools are providing are nutritious for the kids and are of paramount importance, I challenge them from Monday to Friday for a month that they eat the same lunch and see if they still say the same thing. Mm. Well, I haven't seen what they have for lunches, but <clears throat> it looked pretty extravagant to me, actually, but I don't know yeah. what they had. Well, but, yeah. But, yeah, it's, if the government's it's just providing it, it won't be that good. I, I, think, um, <laughs> I think, you know, to sum up what, what I think about this thing is the absolute root cause is, this attitude of buy now, pay later, and it's right through the whole government um, system. Totally. And it should not be allowed because no. once it gets to millions of dollars in interest, you know, they can never get out of it again. And, you know, it, I don't that's know. That, that's the first thing I think has to be dealt with and, and then look at all these other social issues and that to do with the housing. But... You just can't keep going um, without knowing how to run a budget. They should never get into this situation. No, they shouldn't. The thanks same, for your, thanks for your thoughts, goes, Lindley. I've got to go to the next call, so uh, okay. I appreciate your time, and we'll talk next week. Thanks, Cam. Thank Take you. Take care. Okay, bye, bye bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. Good to have you back. Hi, Cam. How are you? Fantastic. What about yourself? That's good. I'm very good, very good as well. Now, did you uh, see the news in the last couple, of, the last few days about Kainga Ora? Basically, um, uh, Bill English has, has conducted an inquiry. He's looked into the books of Kainga Ora, found that it is financially unsustainable moving forward, uh, has record levels of debt, and uh, is basically broke. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I did hear about that, and I thought. Of all the people that could do it, Bing, Bill English is very talented at such work, but he will be poorly recognised because they'll say oh, he's a white male and um, he's got a problem, whereas he's actually very good financially. And yeah, I agree with when you. I look at, um, when I look at Kaingora, what they've got is 
they've got a limited income, which is um, governed by their clientele, spends, I think, something like 25% of their income on rent so that they have 75% of the income to do other things so that they're not in the real world having normal, normal market rules. And then I believe that they also um, go down the path of not being proud homeowners in many cases so that you can often recognize um, Kaingaora places because the owner of the house is the government and the tenant is thinking that they've got a whole lot of rights going in their direction. Now, my, my thoughts are that we need a percentage of government housing and we need a percentage of helping people get into their first home. And I thought, and I thought, well, if you've got all the government, like when my parents and my wife's parents were young, we were considered not middle class, but middle to poor. Yeah. And they got given the ability to capitalize their um, child allowance. The family benefit. And the total of the capitalization of the family benefit or the child allowance was enabling them to have a deposit to buy a house. Yeah. And many of them bought a house, and in so doing, that was their first house, and that a lot of families got a house that way. And because we've had... We don't want any septic tank type thing, so you have to get to the main stormwater system, and in so doing, it costs a fortune to put in the drains, the stormwater, the sewage, and those sorts of things. So now... Although, if you fly over um, Auckland and just, just flying to Hamilton, there's so much bare land that's available that would be good for housing, but then we've got so much red tape around it. Like, if you gave me 50 acres of land yep. and $5 million, I could probably get to 50 to 100 houses with roads on them, connected up to a septic tank system. And whereas if you use the current regulations and things that are being used at the moment, to do the same thing would cost you $50 million, not not $5 million. And so I'm looking and I'm thinking, what we've got here is we've bureaucratized, I guess, our way out of having affordable housing. And then we've got the poor people and we're saying, well, countries like um, the UK, they might have 17% of the housing is... Um, government owned or council council flats and the like and we've got a government previous to the one we've got in now that said oh we will stop landlords from wanting to be landlords by taking away their tax exemption exemptive, sorry their tax exemption on the interest and make everything hard for them and we'll, we'll add more and more rules and call it healthy homes and say it's got to be good for you but the only person it's good for is the people that sell such things and then there's more and more difficulty or competition for tenants. And who are our tenants? They're the poor. And then you've got the poorest of the poor that they don't even get a shot at normal tenancy because they don't look right. If they've got patties on their face or they, they come around in a, in, a, you know, in a bomb and there's a half a dozen of them, no landlord worth of salt says, yes, you're the people for me. They, they look for the best of the 50 people that apply. Yeah. And then, so that puts you back into the government um, having to supply or the council having to supply such things. And they've got 62,000 and two, 62,000 properties and they've got um, 200,000 people living in them. Then they've got a load of people who are um, thugs in them. And so that they have, look, what do they, I think they moved 150 of them for antisocial behavior. But all it yeah. starts way back, it starts at no dads in the house. So if you have a couple and you say to them, you go and finish school till seventh form, don't have a baby before you're 22, 
and get married to one person and then look at what you're going to do, those people will end up owning their own home and becoming perfect citizens. Yeah. But if you say, oh, here's these people with no fathers, so the girls can go out and breed like flies, and so that the girls have two or three kids before they're 20, then someone's going to be funding the bill for that, and they're going to be breeding generations of the same. And so if you've got absent fathers, uneducated people, and if you've got um, the state prepared to be the dad and supply the house and supply you with income, so you've got multiple generations of people who have never had a job and multiple generations of people who rely on the state for everything, then you get a problem like we have. And then if you look at it from someone taking a sensible financial look at it, mm. the thing's broke, and it's um, and it, and it's full of, I really don't want them in my backyard. Like, I live in um, Oraki, and they're putting in, um, I think, 120 houses just behind the Oraki school um, in, a, in a high-rise. Not many people think it's a good idea. No. Not many people think that it's going to add to the quality of the kids that go to the Iraqi school. But there we've got people building in a relatively expensive area a lot of um, very cheap housing. And the people that often move into those places have got other social problems that they bring with them. Yeah. Now, it's, it's all very well to say at the same place, we've got all the Bastion Point um, houses that are, um, they, they have got a whole lot of state houses on Bastion Point on the way up there that I think are they still owned do. by yep. Kangora. Each one of those houses is sitting on a $2 million site, and you could book, block them together and um, get 10 of them together and get 20 million. And with that 20 million, you could build 100 houses somewhere if you were to do it, perhaps in not such an expensive suburb. So it doesn't that point to all then, these things add up? Yeah, doesn't that point to a lack of proper governance by the board of Kainga Ora and then also by the ministers who seem to not have the foggiest idea about what the business or the activity of this government department is, which is to provide cost-effective housing for the least among us. Uh, and they've, and yes. it, that's a classic point where you've got a house sitting on a piece of land that's worth $2 million. The house is probably worth half a million, but if you wanted to buy the whole thing, it would probably cost you $5 million. And you've got one family in that, uh, whereas if you deployed all of that uh, capital in a more cost-effective manner, in a in a an area that's more conducive to to this sort of behaviour, you might have 150 houses as a result, and so that just shows that the, exactly. that, that the I mean, for goodness sake, they had on the board was the chairman of the board was Mark Goshi, who's a former union boss and Labour minister, and they had uh, a guy from the Salvation Army on the board. Now, what remotely qualifies either of them to be on the board of New Zealand's largest landlord? Well, exactly. And also, what they always say, and you hear them say it often, and time and time again, I even heard it, um, old Skippy saying it in Parliament, what about the children? This government wants to take food out of the children's mouths and give it to greedy, rich landlords. And what they've got is they've got... Like, it's an easy line to beat the government with the poor children. Where did the poor children come from? Did the poor children just, like, when there was no social welfare and the family had to look after the child, so if a, a woman had a daughter out of wedlock and the family had to look after the child, um, then the, the family would say, we can't afford too many of these. And so the children would all learn that having... Lots of children um, at home without fathers or without families wasn't a good idea. 
when the government said, oh, we'll give you money for each of those, you can actually now retire on the income of four children um, and not and not do anything. Plus, we'll supply, supply you a house and all this kind of malarkey. Then suddenly what we've got is lots of these things occurring so that the more houses like that you get, the more that you need. And is it reasonable, like if someone has a, a child and them and their partner split up, and then there becomes a problem, and so the, the, the mum goes on child welfare. That's one problem. If the mother has five children, and we say, oh, what about the children? Well, what about teaching the mother responsibility? No, no, we can't do that. We have to have a no-consequence, <laughs> no-fault society where you've got um, everybody making endless mistakes in their life and never having to suffer any consequences. And then you see that with with Kaing Aura. Nobody who's on that board is going to suffer any consequences that had they done what they've done in a private company, they might well find themselves on the receiving end of the long arm of the law. Because uh, yeah. it, it's... They it's, get a lawsuit for such poor behaviour. Yeah. They get a, if they w- didn't get a lawsuit from shareholders... They might actually get um, the the police coming knocking on their door because they've committed fraud or or um, continued trading while trading insolvent. insolvent. They're delinquent that, directors. All of these things, uh, but because it's a government organisation, well, they just get sacked. Then they'll just sit there hoping that the government lo- uh, loses the next election, and then their pals will reappoint them to these positions. And meanwhile, the ministers mm. and the finance minister who were supervising this, Grant Robertson. Megan Woods and Phil Twyford were involved in all of this. These strategic geniuses who uh, were the election strategy uh, planners for the Labour Party, they were the ones who who ran Kaying Aura from the ministry as ministers. And what consequences do they get? Absolutely none. They're still sitting there in their cushy, fat jobs. Grant Robertson's even got get it, got a job where he's paid more than the Prime Minister for the privilege of beggaring the nation. It just it staggers me that there is no financial consequences, and, and maybe, maybe, and I can't see Christopher Luxon doing this, but maybe we should learn something from that fellow in Argentina who's passed all sorts of laws saying that if you're going to print money at the Reserve Bank, well, you'll go to jail. Guess what? They're not printing money. Guess what? Inflation is halved in uh, in in Argentina as a result. Uh, but of course, he's maligned in the media as the wrong kind of person and everything, but that's what we actually need to do. There needs to be real-world consequences for politicians making stupid decisions. Well, I think we need to sterilise people that are irresponsible so that they don't get to have multiple children. And I know it doesn't go with the, with the correct narrative, but if people who can't figure out that I can't afford a house and I can't afford to house my family, and I can't afford to afford my children, breed at 10 times the rate of people who are responsible, eventually there will be only people, like there'll be the 10 people that are responsible left trying to pay taxes to support the 10 million that are irresponsible. Well, it's, you know, Margaret Thatcher famously said in the House of Commons, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. To spend exactly, <laughs> and then when you add that with Ronald Reagan's statement saying the the nine most dreaded words in the English language are yeah. "I'm from the government and I'm here to help you," you're kind of starting to get the where we need to be, but but we're a long way from that. Yeah, indeed. Well, I, I think that Bill English was the right man for the job. The I agree with this information. There is reasons to act. If they act and do the right thing, then we can perhaps have some solutions, but at the end of the day, um, we need to, I think the locking up of land by councils and having these ever tighter cities with ever smaller plots is as big a problem because if the average person has to work 10 years to save up a deposit for a house, that's a tough ask when in the day you could do it in three years. Yeah. And now to do it in three years, you've got to work a couple of jobs. It's still very doable. But again, 
people say, oh, well, I'd rather have an iPhone, I'd rather have a coffee every day. Like, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, I used to have to cut my own lunch. A soft drink was an absolute treat. A beer was a treat when I became older because I was saving for a house. Mm. And guess what? I ended up buying a house or two. Well, you've got a few. <clears throat> well, I had 46, but, but, but what? who's counting? <laughs> well... You're just uh, an inspiration, really. You, you know that it can be done, and I know about your upbringing and and uh, how you were brought up, and and you know having to sleep under a coat, for example, and things like that. So I know <laughs> you've done. I know you've done the hard yards, right? You're the the really hard yards. I know that, and and uh, that's mm. why when when I you know talk to you about these sorts of things, I listen very carefully because you've got experience in it. And you know how these things work, and you know how, with a little bit of training, that people can actually start to get ahead. But the problem is, is our education system doesn't do that training. Their parents don't know, so they can't do the training. And then we have this perpetual cycle of impoverishment that no government seems to know what to do to fix it. Mm. Well, if you save 30% of your um, wages from the time you leave school till you're 28 and you don't get pregnant and then you meet and marry a wife, you'll be a multimillionaire with your investing. And it's that easy. But if you want to have children when you're 15, 16, 17, 18, and you want to have absent fathers because you haven't actually, um, you, you're not some, someone that can keep a man or you're not a man that's worthy of being kept, then life's much harder for you and your children. Exactly. All right, Paul, I'm going to let you run along. And the last um, thing I was going to say oh, yes. is if tall women marry short men, they'll have taller sons, and the short men don't have to have the small man's disease. I just thought I'd let you know that as a, <laughs> in the last closing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mate. It's a little gem, and we'll talk again next week. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> okay, bye for now. Bye. bye. What has happened at Kainga Aura would be criminal if it had happened in a private business. Those responsible need to be held to account. Tell us what you think about the goings-on in Kaingora and what the buddies had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you. So connect with us today.